Hello and welcome to Theology Matters. This is Dr. John Clark. And today we want to continue our discussion on the distinctions between the family of God and fellowship with God. And uh, we may note last time that Jesus in the Word of God makes a big emphasis on the distinction between uh, between being born uh, into the family and behaving and behavior in general. So birth versus behavior. And the first distinction we made last week was that uh, to enter the family of God, you enter it at a point in time, uh, the moment you're born again by faith alone in Jesus Christ and his finished work alone. And then fellowship with God is enjoyed in the present if a believer, somebody who's already been born again, meets the requirement of confession of known sin and if they presently walk in the light. So again, there's only one way to enter the family of God. It's through birth, not behavior. It's not through adoption. It's not through religion. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born again. And uh, again, the birth into the family of God is accomplished by God alone through the word of God. And it's based on a, a moment in time when a believer trusts in the finished work of Jesus Christ who died for their sins and rose again. And just like our physical birth, uh, there's only one spiritual birth needed. And once you are born into the family of God, you cannot be unborn. You don't enter and leave the family of God and then enter and leave and go back and forth. That just doesn't occur with joining the family of God. However, with fellowship with God, there is a an entrance uh, and a removal from, and that is when a believer sins. And we looked at that uh, through the book, uh, through the first chapter of First John, where the use of the word fellowship is used four times in verses three through seven. And uh, we walk through what it looks like Uh, and what it means to have fellowship with God. And then not only that, but God's provision for when a believer does sin, because he he makes uh, very clear and direct statements that believers will sin. In fact, he makes a statement there in 1 John, and if a believer says they have no sin or that they have not sinned, uh, that they're a liar, uh, because that is going to be the experience of believers while they live on this earth. But there is a remedy when, when a believer sins, they are knocked out of fellowship, not knocked out of the family, but they're knocked out of fellowship, and God has provided a remedy to be restored back to fellowship, and it's found in 1 John 1, 9 uh, via the confession of sins. And we're told that God will do two things for the believer who confesses their sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the reason he can do that uh, is because he's faithful. That's his character. He's just. He's because he's already executed the penalty for whatever sin the believer will ever commit. That penalty has already been paid in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that in 1 John 2, 2. Jesus is described as our propitiation. And so in summary for that first point, when a believer is born again, they're brought into the into fellowship with God immediately. But if they sin by walking in darkness, and they will, They will break fellowship with God. However, God has provided a means for restoring fellowship with him via confession of sin. And once the believer confesses their known sin, God restores them to fellowship via forgiveness of sins and cleansing. But however, uh, to remain in ongoing fellowship, the believer must walk in the light. And so we see, again, the distinction between being born into the family of God and being in fellowship. Being born requires a moment in time faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ uh, to be born into the family of God, whereas fellowship requires an ongoing uh, conditions uh, that have to be met, including confession and walking in the light. Now, the second distinction that we want to make between the family of God and fellowship with God it involves um, how many people are in the family of God and how many people are in fellowship with God. Well, uh, to be in the family of God Uh, It's true of all genuine believers in Christ with only one point in time condition, okay? In other words, every believer is in the family of God. That's that's the condition. The condition is becoming a believer, uh, trusting in the finished work of Christ. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith 
in Christ Jesus. Again, notice we are born into the family of God by faith in Christ Jesus and that this is true of all who do that. Again, faith in Christ is the only condition. Go back over to 1 John chapter 5 in verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So again, what's the condition to be born into the family? It's simple faith in Jesus Christ. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. Okay, so let's look at that. First, that, that first phrase is born and who is begotten of him are both in the perfect passive form, both indicating a, um, a one-time event or a point in time birth, if you will, with ongoing results in the presence. In other words, you were born into the family and you remain a part of the family. That's what's emphasized there um, through the phrase is born of God and is begotten of him. And again, notice the point in time condition for entering the family of God. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, is, is the Messiah, the one who died for you and rose again. Now, as we consider the distinction it whereas being in the family of God is true of all believers uh, fellowship with God is not true of all believers in fact we go back to first John 1 and when we look in that section first John 1 verse 6 through first John 2 verse 1 you're going to see six ifs six conditional um, words uh, ifs that indicate that fellowship with God has ongoing condition. And so it might be true of some believers at any point in time. It's definitely not true of all believers at every point in time because not all believers are meeting the ongoing conditions to be in fellowship with the Lord. So all of these ifs, as we look at them, are what's known as third class conditions in the Greek. It means it might be or it might not be. Again, third class conditions assume the probability or the possibility of something, but not the reality of it happening. In other words, it could happen. It's possible. It's probable even. It should happen. We want it to happen, but it may not happen uh, consistently, as in walking in the light. We want to walk in the light. Everything is, is provided for us to walk in the light, but we don't often do that at every moment of every day. And so even in 1 John 1, it, it shows us this distinction. Again, all believers in Christ are are a part of the family of God, but not all believers, not everyone who's part of the family is at every moment in fellowship with God. And so we learn from this that all believers can have fellowship with God, but not all do have fellowship with God. Why? Because not all believers are walking in the light and not all believers have confessed their known sins. And that moves us really to the third distinction and uh, we want to spend uh, a little bit more time on this one. But uh, to be in the family of God, when we, we, be, we look at this third distinction, we want to look at the concept of forgiveness. And the moment one is born into the family of God, their sins are positionally or judicially forgiven as to their ultimate penalty, which is the second death or eternal death. In fact, 1 John 2.12, since we're staying uh, in 1 John or we're there some, says this, 1 John 2.12, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And, and you think, well, wait a minute. Didn't he just say that we have to confess our sins to be forgiven? And what we're going to point out is that uh, the, our, our sins that are forgiven when we join or we're born into the family of God are positional or judicial, whereas the sins that we commit after we're saved are, are going to be forgiven as well, but more in a parental um, parental component, an immediate penalty component, not the ultimate penalty component. And this is why in 1 John 2.12, when he says, uh, again, because your sins are forgiven, you are forgiven is a perfect passive indicating that the believer's sins are forgiven at a point in time in the past, again, by an outside source, namely God, and that they remain forgiven in the present. And so this tense describes not only the completed act, but the completed act's ongoing results. 
So not only is it a done deal, but it remains a done deal, never to be undone. And this is why other passages such as Ephesians 1 verse 7 and Colossians 2 13 say this, Ephesians 1 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Again, forgiveness is based on God's grace, not on some condition that we must uh, meet in terms of uh, behavior. Okay, we, we trust in the finished work of Christ who met and paid uh, the full just penalty for our sins. Look at Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So again, we see that uh, when we joined the family of God, when we were born into the family of God, our sins were positionally or judicially forgiven as to their ultimate penalty. We'll never have to face that second death. The wages of sin is death. We'll never have to face it. That's why John 3, 16 makes the promise that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you'll never perish. Now, in contrast, we look at uh, a distinction with fellowship with God. Because when we talk about sins that we commit after we're saved, we understand that the ultimate penalty, the positional or judicial forgiveness has already been provided by the finished work of Christ. So what forgiveness comes after we're saved? Well, sins are what we might say parentally forgiven us. And it's, and it's to their immediate penalty, meaning relational death or separation i.e. a breaking of fellowship. You know, death by definition means separation. And so even after we're saved, even though uh, that sin uh, could never send us to hell, uh, it can cause a break of fellowship. It can cause a relational death uh, within the family of God known as a break of fellowship. And so that's why we have 1 John 1, 9, and that's why uh, the forgiveness in 1 John 1, 9 is, is a family forgiveness. It's a relational uh, fellowship forgiveness, I'll say. So when, once you're in the family, that's what we're talking about. It's not to get into the family, but once you're born into the family, there's a relational or a fellowship forgiveness um, that is described here. It's, it's basically enjoying uh, a forgiveness that restores you to fellowship. And so look at 1 John 1, 9 again, because it says, if we confess our sins, who's the we there? Well, it's, uh, it's believers. This is, uh, John is talking about himself. If we uh, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And again, this is the condition that needs to be met to be restored to fellowship. And so we'll look more next time at this difference between positional forgiveness and parental forgiveness. 